the fourth episode of the Wide World of Wayne podcast. I'm Wayne Viner. Along with me is Cordell Woodland. Cordell, welcome in this evening. Hey, Wayne. Glad to be here again. Big news of the weekend. I got to go to New Jersey and see the Maryland Terrapins win 48-7. to Sort of skipped okay. the Redskins on Sunday, but, man, the news around here is, of course, Jay Gruden no longer the coach. Uh, coach Callahan, formerly of the Raiders, formerly of Nebraska, and most recently the offensive line coach for the Redskins takes over. Cordell, you've worked in that building last season. What's your feeling about what happened to poor Jay? Well, Wayne, we talked about it a little bit last week. Uh, Jay was just the first piece of the puzzle to go. Um, I think everybody kind of knew this was coming at some point, maybe not when, um, but we knew this was coming. We got to remember, this is the first time Jay Gruden had, um, uh, Dan Snyder has fired a coach midseason since Marty Schottenheimer, and that was, what, 2000? So this isn't, as bad as the Redskins have been over the years, this isn't something that they typically do. Do, do, you, mean, um, do you mean Norv Turner? Uh. North Turner, I'm sorry, yeah, North Turner. Yep. North Turner, but, uh, no, yeah, that's right, because North Turner was asked to come in at the same time that Jay Gruden was asked to come in, which was 5 o'clock in the morning today to be fired. Yeah, doesn't that sort of stink? <laughs> it does. I was told, a, I saw a funny tweet today that said North Turner always arrived at 5 o'clock every day, but to spite them on that day, he showed up at 9 a.m. <laughs> uh, they, they, they deserve it. Um, look, firing Jay isn't going to do anything. I, I put a tweet right. out earlier today. They could hire Newt Rockney, and it wouldn't matter because they have managed to take the Redskins, and the they is, is Danny and uh, Bruce Allen, have managed to take the Redskins down to what used to be known as the Mendoza line, which is the right. line. If you hit lower than that, you can't play. The Redskins... Right. Have finally hit that line, and great job, guys. You, you've done the impossible. You have made the Redskins irrelevant. And the way I know that is after being a Redskins fan my whole life, before I was a Maryland fan, nobody particularly called me. Yeah, later in the day, some people said, isn't that a shame? But the phone didn't blow up. I listened to our friend Kevin Sheehan on 980. Yeah, it was a, you know, it's a good show, but nobody was surprised. And you need to move on from here, but nobody believes they will. It doesn't matter who they hire. It doesn't matter who the quarterback is. That's why nobody goes to the games anymore. And this goes back to last week's theme about Penn State. Why can't you have good things? Because you break everything we give you. It's like talking to a child. You can't have nice things because you screwed this franchise up so much that nobody wants to go to the game anymore. I don't and, know. You know I'm, I'm sorry I cut you off, Wayne. You, you know, with, with the biggest problem to me, I feel like, is uh, when somebody's insane and they, and, they does, and they don't know it, you know, and this is a team that's in denial. Uh, in the Bruce Allen press, press conference he had earlier, it was nothing but blame that I saw him being passed around. He even took it as far to blame the fans as to why they're, why the away team is taking over FedEx Field. Wait, I, I, I can't for the, for the life of me understand why he doesn't get the fact that if there was an actual product on the field, not to mention the fact that you're selling beers for $14 a pop, but if there was an actual product on the field to watch, these same fans, which has been one of the most loyal fan bases in sports, has, would be there packing the house. This, this is, and this is a guy that also in a press conference that I could tell was passing blame down to the coaching staff because in his mind, he thinks he's put together a roster to win. He truly believes that. He has to go. The, he, he's the biggest piece, I think, right now. It's, I think outside, I'll say the biggest realistic piece that we can fix because there's no point in talking about Danny Snyder not being here. He's not going anywhere. But Bruce Allen, he can be replaced. It won't matter. It didn't matter with Vinny Serrato. Right. Doesn't matter. Oh, it's Bruce yeah. Oh, Allen. Uh, yes, I, I, I definitely remember Vinny Serrato. <laughs> uh, there's two teams right now in pro sports that have the same footprint: the Knicks 
who should be the dominant team or one of the dominant teams in the NBA and one of the dominant right. brands in the world, and the All Redskins. Right. Both of them have yep. fan bases. You couldn't you couldn't kill this. You couldn't mess this up. Yet they did. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know what to say other than it just doesn't pay to be a, a Redskin fan anymore. To get me to no. not watch the Redskins. I mean, there have been times. There are weddings I have missed. Bar mitzvahs I didn't go to yeah. because the Redskins played. And now I don't yeah. care. It's not that I don't care. It's just not worth watching. If he wants to make it his team, and he does instead of our team, then that's fine. But he can sit there and watch it by himself. Which is what he's doing. Yeah. Which is exactly what he's doing when he goes to FedEx Field. Well, he's watching it with his family, friends, and the away team fans. You know, that, that's who he's watching it with because there's no Redskins fans there, Wayne. There's no Redskins fans there. I was at the Chicago game two weeks ago, and it, my section was filled with bears. Filled with bears. There wasn't a Redskins fan for at least six rows. It's, it's, FedEx Field is a mess. We have no home field advantage. The Redskins are a complete left mess. And the thing that, another thing that Bruce Allen said today was that he believes that the culture is great. This, what, what culture do we have right now except but to ruin everything we do, to make the wrong decision in everything? And everything now with the Bothell and the Trent Williams situation, because by the time he decides to trade him, he'll have no value. He'll have no value. It's it's a mess, Wayne. We're we're sinking and we're sinking fast. I think we've sunk, and oh, <laughs> unfortunately, I I really think that this is over. You take a yeah. look at a picture in the Washington Post. Um, New England intercepted the ball, and all you see is people in Patriots mm -hmm. jerseys with their arms up. You know, as much as I say I don't care, we just spent seven minutes talking about this, or eight minutes, <laughs> um, and it's only because of their arrogance. If they had actually right. come out and said, look, eight guys who were supposed to start, including their entire cap hit, which is Trent Williams, as you pointed out, Alex uh, Smith, the quarterback, uh, Darius Geis is supposed to be the starter, Brandon right. Scherf's out, for a while McLaren was out, the number one tight end, if he was in one piece, one of the best in the league, uh, Jordan, out. And his backup. <laughs> and, his, and his backup's out, and I think Josh Rebus has been out. And basically, it's seven or eight pieces. They're not there. Any team that's missing seven or eight pieces of their offense, especially when it's that seven or eight most expensive pieces, is going to look like crap. So. Yeah. I wish that they would have at least stood up and said, look, it might not exactly be Jay's fault. We're missing eight pieces, but right. it's time to move on. Uh, I'm sorry. He's done know, a great job. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right, Wayne. That would have went a long way. I, and not that I think it would have made anybody feel like, oh, no, let's keep Bruce Allen here now because he's saying that it's his fault. No, but it would have gained an ounce of respect back from me for Bruce, Bruce Allen instead of going out there and basically saying, yep, this is all Jay's fault, and yep, it's your fault for not coming to the game that we don't have a home field advantage. We're doing our part. Everybody else isn't doing their part. That's what I heard today, honestly, Wayne. The best part of the day for me came in Bill Callahan's press conference because at least for once this year, I got to hear a plan in place for Dwayne Haskins. This whole time, all we've been getting told is, well, he's not ready. He's not ready. Well, what does he have to do to be ready? When is he going to be ready? Is there a projection? At least Bill Callahan today came out talking about they want to put together a group of plays for him. They're going to give him reps with the first team. They're going to try to transition him along. It, instead of just saying, nope, he's not playing this week, and he's going to be on the scout team. If he doesn't learn offense there, then he won't learn it. Look, I... Uh... Okay, I'll take the bait on this one. I'm, I'm anxious to get to Maryland, but Clinton Portis says they really shouldn't play him this year. He's not ready. Fred Smoot says he's not ready. Those are the guys that come on the radio in D.C. and talk about what the players think. Right. I don't know if the guy's ready or not, but Clinton had a good point, which is if, if Haskins comes in and he really isn't ready, when this season's over, everybody's going to say, you know what, Haskins is part of the problem. Get rid of yeah. him, too. Oh, so, yeah, we love to play Blaine. You yep. know that. We're quick to do that. So um, I said that if both teams lost, next weekend's game is going to be like yep. the Super Bowl of losers. Uh, yeah. 
I guess we'll have to talk about this again on Thursday, make our picks for who actually is going to get the number one pick. And, uh, you know, uh, right now, I think the Dolphins probably going to beat the Redskins. Uh, yeah. All uh, right. It wouldn't surprise me. It honestly would. We still don't know who our quarterback is Sunday either. So, you know. Well, there's a lot of things we don't know. But other than the – it's like watching a car accident or a, a NASCAR race in that case. You stay around to see the crash, the flashing lights, and then once that's gone, there's nothing to see, and that's going to be the Redskins season. You are listening to the Wide World of Wayne podcast here at the Viner Four Gates studio in Rockville. Cordell is at the CBS Sports Radio studios in Baltimore. And this podcast brought to you by Viner Consulting. For your IT needs, for your small and medium-sized business, Microsoft Consulting, Office 365, Building a better website, Viner Four Gates is the place to go. We can help your small business be better. Give us a call in Rockville at 301 251 2900. You get a free, no cost assessment of where you are. We'll be there to answer your questions. It's run by Terps. You'll be served by a Maryland Terrapin. And there's no better way to go than with Viner Four Gates, 301 251 2900. Or on the web at oneviner.com. That's the numeral one, V-I-E-N is in Nebraska, E-R.com. And, yeah, we're going to beat Nebraska in November. I had to throw that in there. All right, the Terrapins go to New Jersey, reeling. Uh, the combined score, the Rutgers lost to Michigan, Maryland's lost to Penn State, was 111 to nothing. And after the first quarter, I was wondering if, if this might be Rutgers' day, and then Maryland just explodes and they look like the team that showed up the first two weeks what's your take on maryland's trip to piscataway new jersey well it was a game maryland had to win uh you know they have been reeling they had, the last few games they it just didn't go the way that they wanted to obviously the temple loss and the embarrassment uh on friday night at home to penn state uh Rutgers could not have shown up on the schedule at a better time <laughs> this was the Maryland was desperate. They needed a win. They went out there and got it. Everybody looked good. Uh, you know, and the running game is – and Coach Locks has been saying it since they won. Everybody knows that the running the running backs is the strength of their offense. They, te- they have to tailor everything through them, and it sucks that the injuries have hit them as hard as it has, especially on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, but they have – if the, the offense is only going to go as far as the running backs take them, and we saw that on Saturday. Yeah, what we saw was home run threat and then three and out. So you look at yeah. Ant, he's Anthony McFarlane, a beautiful 80-yard run, but he has eight carries for 88 yards. So he had seven carries for eight yards and one for 80. So they're either one yard or they're gone. Javon Leak yeah. is a great example of that. What a kickoff return. This guy has major league talent uh, with between he and Ant. They really should be an unstoppable combo, but there's problems on the offensive line. But the biggest problem might be, because it's the focal point of every team, the quarterback. Well, Josh Jackson still yeah. looked a bit iffy uh, yeah. going towards halftime. Maryland had two timeouts in their pocket, got the ball with about 30 seconds left, 70 yards away. In the press box, we were saying, all right, uh, victory formation, take a knee and get out of here. Maryland... And they've been saying this the whole time, so it's not new, and they didn't make it up for this game, has been saying the offense isn't really in sync. We need as many reps as we can get. So they right. decide to run the two-minute offense. And just about the time that Don Marcus from the Sun says, you know, if they keep this up, he could get hurt. Before the word hurt was finished, leaving his lips, Josh Jackson was in a heap on the field. We thought he broke his leg. It's, oh, o- it's only a high ankle sprain, but they had to bring out the – John Deere cart and drive him away and that's right. never a good sign so Josh Jackson high ankle sprain probably out for a while then Piggy comes in and Piggy looked pretty good and in fact uh-huh. if you go on and we're going to play a, a little piece here of Terrell Pagrom talking about the fact that I thought he looked about as fast as he did when he played at Texas when Maryland went to Texas and beat them so here's Piggy 
run in the fourth quarter and come back by a penalty. That looked like the piggy we saw against Texas. Did, did you feel the burst on that one? Because you really sped up. Uh, I guess you could say that, but like not really though. You know what I'm saying? I'm just not getting back. So I feel like, like I told you before, like I feel way comfortable. I had to brace. Lost, you know what I'm saying? Lost, lost a lot of weight too. So I feel back like I'm at the same weight I was doing Texas doing that same year. So I feel back to myself really. You feel, you feel better than you did when you came in for the last few games last year uh -huh. physically? Yeah, definitely. They definitely like because with the brace, you know, nothing was wrong with the brace, but I feel like it was like helping me secure. But like I didn't feel the same as I was against Texas, you know. Yeah. And like having it off and knocking that weight off too that I had, I just feel better. Okay. So you're no more brace, right? No I more. Okay. Yeah, no more brace. Okay. Congrats. Uh, Thank you. Piggy, happy to not be wearing the knee brace. Thinks he's lost enough weight. He's fast again. I hope he's right. The defense that nobody really talks about, hey, they held, really, they, uh, Rutgers should have had 13 points, missed a couple field goals. But, look, we'll take the seven. Defense, after one drive, pretty much shut down Rutgers. They got an interception by Allende Ely. You got an a interception by a guy that they nicknamed Stonehands. So that means Isaiah Davis had a good day. He got an interception. And on the two fourth and one plays, when Maryland needed to stop them, when the game was still in the balance, Maryland just stuffs them on fourth and one. And I don't care who you're playing. If you're Maryland and you can stop somebody on fourth and one, take it because usually that goes the other way. Uh, and as I said last week, look, you've been in the newsroom there. You, you've been managing shows all day. I'm sure the Terps have come up. What's the look ahead in Baltimore to the game in West Lafayette, Indiana against Purdue on Saturday? Well, it's a similar situation to this week. This is an opportunity for Maryland uh, to rack up back-to-back -back wins in conference. Uh, Purdue is, is kind of reeling as well. Now, it won't be easy to go into Purdue because, you know, it's still a tough place to go in and get a win. Um, so Maryland has got to be focused, especially considering the fact, again, the injuries are piling up. You just brought up Josh Jackson getting hurt uh, in the last game, so Piggy's going to go out there. Um, but it was good that Piggy got to get it. Well, Piggy's been getting getting in a lot throughout the season, of course, but like Coach uh, Loxley said, the reason that they were continuing to run their offense, especially when Piggy was in, was because they wanted him to get the reps. Uh and, and they have a special package for him. They have special plays that they run specifically for him. So it'll be good to see Piggy get out there. Uh, it'll definitely be tough for the offense. But the defense, like you said, man, the defense has really uh, played well. At times, of course, they've had their moments. But overall, I mean, they've played about as good as you can hope for considering the injuries uh, that Maryland's dealing with. All right. Uh, for this Monday night, that'll about do it. Um, I'd like to thank... Viner Forgates for hosting the show as always. Cordell, you're a regular now, so we'll do this again on Thursday. This is Wayne Viner. You're listening to the fourth episode of The Wide World of Wayne. As usual, go Terps, and everybody, thank you so much for listening. We will see you on Thursday night, and you can listen to this Terp podcast again on terptalk.com. Thanks. <laughs>